Noon. I can't blame you. The weather's great outside. So if there's a few more of you want to go out and get some fresh air, I can't blame you at all. It's a beautiful afternoon. And I'll tell you, I have learned a lot of new things today. How about you guys? It's been some great talks, some great lectures, and I hope we can learn a little bit more this afternoon. And what I found out is, whoa, <laughs> that is great. I like that, the echo system. Um, I like to learn new things, and I enjoyed that about the financial stuff. You know, t typically we don't learn much about money in medical school, so I've had to sort of learn the hard way. <laughs> um, but as, as I've gone through life, and I, I, many of you can probably identify with, the more I learn about anything, the less I seem to know. And it, it's humbling. And that's why, as time goes on, the human body, I realize we really know very little about the human body. And yet, sometimes people act as if they know everything about the human body. But we are just now learning about how the brain works. We're just now understanding how the trillion bacteria in the body works. We're now learning more and more about how food can be used to treat disease and prevent disease. We're also learning how having healthy thoughts in the mind can be used to prevent and treat disease. And yet, even though the more I learn, the less I know, it's getting more confusing out there all the time. For instance, I read an article and I wrote a blog on my, that's going to come out next week about the literature that's out there in medical science. The gold standard in medicine is these double-blinded, randomized studies. And yet, an article came out last week that said 70 to 80 of the percent of these gold standard studies that physicians depend on to make decisions are being written and paid for by the people that are making the product. So it's getting harder to know who and what to believe. And that's why I use the scriptures as a gold standard. Not that I don't read these studies, but I always the place I look first is conflict of interests. If they're working for the place that they're promoting the product and the drug study, I think twice, I think twice about the validity of that article. And yet, seven to eight out of 10 articles are, are heading in that direction. Isn't that amazing? So, so truly, you know, in medicine, a lot of people also like to make things black and white. But each person here has an individual physiology, an individual genetic makeup that we're just now beginning to understand. Francis Collins wrote a great book a few years ago, and he was the one that led the team that actually sequenced our, our DNA our DNA, and he looked at the 64,000 genes that come from our DNA and how unique they are. And the future of medicine is going to be on what turns on and off these genes. What makes a gene do something? And why, if we have a cancer gene that's been there our whole lives, why is it turned on and other genes are not turned off? What triggers these genes? And there's a vast field that's developing. It's called epigenetics. How, what are turning on and off these genes? It's very exciting because we've only had this the last few years. And now we're noting that each person has a unique genetic, genetic makeup. We can actually, if, if a person were to need a medication, we can actually dis have discrete dosages for an individual based on how their genetics, their liver, their kidneys might be breaking down medications. We can actually, in the future, know which foods tend to turn on certain enzyme systems in the body that can make it even more healthy. We might be able to discover, if the world lasts long enough, how the brain and sleep regulates our certain genes as we go on through life, and how much sleep a person might need exactly during the day. Well, we might say six to eight hours or two, you feel good. Well, we might say, that is a beautiful tie, by the way, that purple tie. We might be able to say, sir, you need 6.25 hours of good rest a day. That's your optimal you need for your gen genetic makeup. 825. 825. He's already figured it out. 
Um, there's a fascinating field now that's going on in the brain. And actually, the government of the United States saying this is going to be the year of the brain. And they're putting millions and millions and millions of dollars in studying how the brain's made up. There's research now going on, as far as the brain's concerned, where you can actually, they're working on downloading habits into brains. You know, like you want to download the habit of speaking German? Well, they're working on that type of technology. This is scary to me. You know, how far can we go? We can already clone animals. We already have the ability to make genetic clones of animals. We also have the technology to genetically clone people and organs. The technology is there, but, but what are we going to do with this? And yet we remember the text in the Bible that says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be today. So these are some scientific medical things, symbols that are all around us that really tells us that just like we've been talking about this weekend, we are at the end of the world's history. And I just love the talks we heard today about what our duty is to find God's will, to go out there and preach the gospel. And I love it how we have reassurance in what we've grown up as as a church. We have reassurance that the Bible is true, a true north. And prophecy is one of the best ways, I think, when you have someone that doesn't believe in the truth of the Bible, to prove the Bible. There's our discrete dates we can show doubters. But also, I'm glad now that we have medical technology to also prove that the Bible is true. We now have technology that says that Mary Hart's good like medicine. It's fun to laugh. We now know the endorphins go up. It deactivates stress-related genes. It's a good thing. Well, we have science now to prove that the Bible is true. For a few minutes today, we're going to talk about worship and how our worship itself changes our physiology for the good. Just like exercise changes our physiology for good, we talked about water. We've talked about anything that goes with God's original design is going to improve our stress chemistry. Anything that goes against it, things that we control and can't damage our DNA, we're now going to learn how worship changes every cell in our body, and worship is indeed a biblical prescription for life. You're going to be surprised at some of the information that's out there today, how technology is growing so fast. Unfortunately, I've tried to get some people over the few years interested in doing studies on worship and belief systems and how it changes our body and DNA, but no one wants to fund these studies. You know, no one wants to put out the millions and millions of dollars to fund these. And yet, right now in the United States, last year there was about 4 billion prescription medications written, and, all, and they say that only 70% of those medicines actually do anything and work. They're funding that like crazy. Trillions of dollars in that. So there's a few of us out there that are searching the literature to bring information to people that will give them tools to prove, again, that the Bible's true, to give other treatments. So we have really been changing our entire body for the good today. As we've heard our speakers, Dr. McNulty and Dr. Reed and Dr. Bohr speak, we've been in states of worship, and we've actually been changing our very genetic makeup. We've actually been hopefully lowering our stress. But the studies are going to show that as we worship incorrectly, we can actually damage our very bodies. And we're going to find out that we now have the technology that we could actually go into churches and study people's worship and say, this type of worship is good for you, this type of worship is bad for you, on a genetic as well as a physiologic level. Now that would scare some churches, wouldn't it? So we've already talked about biblical scriptures. Isaiah 43, 20. Oh, boy. <laughs> this is the entirely long le lecture. Let me, let me stop this one. We've already talked about this one. Let me hit the escape button.
There we go. That looks better. Um, so we're going to talk. So worship is a biblical prescription for life. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, I want to focus on this. I know I shouldn't have favorite text, but this is one of my favorites, okay? <laughs> Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So what does come to me mean to you? What does come to me mean? Thank you, Rick. Okay. What does come to you? Come to me. Come be with me. Have a relationship with me. Worship with me. Make me part of your life. When you have problems, come to me, all you labor in are heavy laden. That, couldn't that describe the stress we've talked about? All this world that we live under, this, this is, remember, this is not our home. And all the stress, we're working hard, there's lots of burdens around us, some of us we can control, some of it we can't control. And what, does, what do we say here? And I will give you, give you, it's a gift, I will give you rest. We're going to find out that one of the treatments, one of the most valuable treatments for stress in a life is rest. And I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about today about the three components of rest that I try to prescribe to people based on the Bible. Because rest is the most valuable treatment. God set this up at the very beginning at creation. And we talked earlier today about how creation is going to be an issue at the end of time, and we're seeing it every day. But one of the rules we're violating from creation is we're not taking a day of rest. And that was designed at the very beginning. It says, come to me when you're under stress, and I will give you rest. It says, come to the God, the true God of the universe, the God that we worship, and I'm going to give you this. It's a gift that we accept. Again, nothing that we do. We accept that gift. We accept Christ in our lives to do the work to change us. But he's asking us to come to him. And I just love this text because when someone comes to me and stressed out, I say one of the first things I want you to do is, is start to worship. Come to God in worship. But first, I'm going to tell you about a patient of mine named Tom. And some of you, um, Tom was a businessman. And he was 34 years old with two children when he was working one day, and he had um, severe crushing chest pain. And I hope no one here has to go through a heart attack. But he was 34, and he thought, maybe, maybe I have some indigestion. He says, I'm 34, I'm healthy, I don't eat bad food, um, I keep my, my stress isn't the best, I don't smoke cigarettes, don't have a strong family history, have two kids, how could I be having a heart attack, you know? But sure enough, he had the chesting pain. He came to the emergency room. We found out that he had he, one of his arteries, the right coronary artery, was 100% blocked. And when that artery's blocked, the part of the heart that gets blood doesn't get the blood. No oxygen. A muscle doesn't get oxygen. It starts to hurt. He was in the, in the, in the middle of a heart attack. Luckily, he was in within the first hour and a half, able to put a stent in, opened up that artery, and aborted major damage to the artery of the heart. So he came back to the doctors that cared for him. I did not see him originally. He came back to the doctors that cared for him, and um, he still didn't feel very good. And, you know, they said, well, let's do some more testing. And he's still having chest pain, still having a lot of worry. Um, they put him on all the medicines. They had to do another angiogram on him to look at the arteries again, and the stent was fine. No, no problem wrong with the stent. But he, every time he walked, he kept having chest pains. Well, they started looking, and they looked for pulmonary embolisms and aortic dissections, and they looked in his stomach, and they looked in his muscles, and they couldn't find anything wrong with Tom. Nothing. It was driving his life crazy, because he was in the emergency room. The first three months, he was in the room, emergency room 14 times. 14 times. Now, I admit, Tom, when I met him, you can tell when you sit down in a room with the patient, he was type A. He was genetically type A. Do we have any type A's here? Okay, you know it if you're type A. There's genetic type A's. He was a genetic type A, and I could sense that. I just sit there, and I started getting nervous, you know, even in the room with the guy. But he kept having pain, and people refer to me after they probably 
tried everything else and I get second referrals. In, in my practice, after they've done all the stints and the bypass, the patient's still having problems. They say, well, let's get a consultation with Dr. Markham. So I sort of get, I'm used to having these type of patients. Um, so he comes in and I, I start going through things with him and he was eating a pretty healthy diet and he was exercising and he, he just wanted to feel well again. His wife was threatening to leave him. The job was threatening to fire him. Tom was only 34, but things were pretty bad. But somehow this event, this major health catastrophe in his life, set off a cascade of stress chemistry in his brain that was creating inflammation in his body that he was having a hard time dealing with. So really, it wasn't the disease in the heart anymore, but it turned on some bad chemistry in the brain. He was stressed out. And we're going to talk a little bit about brain chemistry today, but, but Tom was stressed out. So I went through all the, all the medical techniques I knew. But then, as we, we talked together, a, a text in the Bible, a, a biblical text kept coming to man. As a man thinketh, I said, well, maybe there's nothing really... There's something wrong, no doubt. Every, every symptom that we have, there's chemistry behind it. But maybe there was chemistry that was, you know, in the brain that Tom was, wasn't dealing with that was turning on inflammation in his body. Well, I measured some inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein and acid rate, and they were up a little bit. Blood sugar was up a little bit. But how do you treat that? Well, Tom was the very first person that I introduced into the physiology of worship. And I taught him how to use worship and rest to turn off the stress chemistry of the brain. It did not come easily, okay? He wasn't, he, he, he'd grown up from a Christian home, but he wasn't attending. But as we sort of worked through this and explained some of the biblical principles, he was willing to give it a try. It took about eight months Eight months, but today he has no pain in his chest at all. None. It took eight months. So a biblical prescription for life was the treatment of worship, and we were able to monitor his inflammation in his body and his symptoms, and eventually as his brain healed, the brain stress chemistry turned off some of this damaging um, inflammation that was causing chest pain that really simulated his heart pain. And can you imagine every day living in fear of a heart attack, scared to death? He ran to the emergency room, and yet I see so many patients every day that really the body's in pretty good shape, but it's the brain that's creating the disease. It's estimated now that in the United States, one in three people have some type of anxiety disorder. 18% of people right now are on some type of prescription medications for anxiety. So if we can get at the cause... It's much better to treat symptoms. And as you can imagine, this takes time in an office. It doesn't happen in the 10 to 20 minutes they give us with the patient. So I taught Tom a little bit about worship. And I'm going to sort of go through some of the, the thought process I had to go through. And the, one of the first things I had to get him to believe in, since we were teaching biblical prescriptions, was the fact that the Bible was something he could depend on, a true north, something that was true. So we went through some of the scriptures in the Bible, the archaeology and some of the things, and eventually he realized the Bible was true. And, and so we went through different types of worship. I said, well, how did Adam worship years ago? Well, how, how did God have Adam worship? Well, you know, he worked six days, right? And he took a day off. He, I'm sure he went out in the garden. He communed with God directly. He had some animals that he could deal with. He broke his routine. You know, that's how he worked, and he worshiped with God. So Adam, Adam probably didn't worship the way we do today because he didn't have big churches. He didn't have the scriptures at time. So Adam worshiped much differently than we worshiped, and that's probably how they worshiped on earth for quite a bit of time. But what a way to worship, right? In a beautiful world with God leading you along the way. You know? Oh, but that's how Adam started. Well, how did Enoch worship? How did Enoch worship? Well, we don't know a lot about Enoch, but we know that he walked with God. And he, his worship was so advanced that he, the God took him to heaven. The word for worship, the Hebrew word that they used was one called, I don't know if I can say it right, but it's H-A-L-A-K, halak. And that didn't really mean walking, it meant moving with God. 
So in Enoch's way of worship, he moved with God. And when you move with God, that probably, his worship probably encompassed every aspect of life. If you're moving with God, it's probably with God every day. And his worship was so advanced that God said, listen, I'm going to, let, let's be together. You know, you're here enough. Let me take you to heaven. So his worship was probably much different even than Adam's worship. Well, think about Noah. How did he worship? You know, you think, you think a lot of people were coming to church with him when he was building the boat? I'm sure he took a day off every now and then, but he did a lot of, I'm sure he did a lot of service in his worship, but Noah's worship pattern was much different. I'm sure he didn't have a a big church to go to. Of course, he didn't have scripture to go to. Of course, he was able to commune with God, but worship through the ages has changed. In the New Testament, Stephen, you know, his worship must have been tremendous because remember, as he was being stoned, I'm sure that was under the most severest pain that he had. But he didn't even think about what he was suffering, remember? He was only thinking about the people that were hurting him. Worship had taken him to him such a place that his brain probably was able to block out pain with the Lord's help and said, God, forgive them for they, they know not what they do. Amen. And yet, you know, he was under extreme pain and extreme stress, so his worship took him to some really interesting things. Now, throughout ages, as as I I talk to Tom, how people worship, as we can see, is much different. It's changed over times. And there's many different ways to worship. Of course, you know, reading the Bible, the Word of God, the gold standard of worship, where we can commune with God every day, we can be with Him, we can read His work, work. his scriptures. We can come together and talk about it as a group and see how it applies to our lives. That's the gold standard of worship. But still yet, there's large segments of the world that can't read even. 30% of the patients that come to my office are functionally illiterate. 30%. Not everyone has the ability to read, but Bible study and read is a wonderful way to worship. Prayer, as we commune with God and we talk to God, as we enter into a relationship with Him. um, Prayer is so important. It's an important method of worship. As you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. I like to think service is a mode of worship. One of the hardest things I have to do, even after 27 years of practicing cardio, I still have to be on call, you know, and that's very hard for me on Sabbath to go in and be on call. Now, I don't do elective work on on the Sabbath, but I still round on all the patients. But one of the things that's helped me is I try to enter into a mode. I say, well, my service is worship today. So I I try, you know, so that's going to be my worship today. I keep, I can pray, but it doesn't quite feel as good a worship as today has. But I still try to create a spirit of worship. Some people worship by giving thanks to God. And that's what I've been trying to do more in my life is, it seems like when I pray, I always ask for something. Well, how would you feel if someone always came up to you all the time and asked for stuff? You know, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you take care of this for me? Well, I'm trying in my prayer life to say thank you first, right? Say thanks and praise first. And, you know, that's a way I'm cha- acknowledging God and worshiping Him. Um, praise is a wonderful way to worship. Being outside in nature. Sometimes I have my best worship as I'm walking outside. Um, uh, I like to hike, going on a walk, um, going on the beach. Um, How many of you like to worship in that manner too? But the more you get into worship, the more you realize that worship is a way of life based on a relationship, and there's high days of worship too. I like to think caring for your body, you know, being a good steward is a way that you can worship too, where you can come into Him by just taking care of yourself. And also, like we're doing today, meeting with believers, encouraging each other, learning new things, building each other up, learning how to find God's purpose in our life. These are all methods of worship. So in dealing with Tom, I started talking about his methods of worship. Now, Tom didn't start out in Bible study. This did not do it for him. But he did like to go out in nature. And I said, well, you know, God's second book is nature. Look at nature and see how you feel. And over time, as Tom walked in nature, learned how to do some things like this, he eventually decided to start studying the Bible. And that's when his worship really changed. 
Now, I want to talk a little bit. I'm, I hope everyone's not too tired. Because out of all the talks I give, this is the most complicated one. So if, if I'm going too fast, raise your hands and we'll start over. <laughs> but this is important. This is important because this helps bring everything together that we've talked about. The stress and the biblical prescriptions. Our brain, Dr. McLean, several years ago, said that our brain is made of three functional layers. Three parts of our brain, three functional layers. And he did this before we had brain imaging, before we had the ability to have MRIs, CAT scans, and EGs. The people there thought he was crazy, just like Galileo. They thought Galileo was crazy, because remember, he said the earth was round, and everyone else thought it was flat. Well, they thought Dr. McLean was crazy when he had three functional layers, but now that we can image the brain, yes, we know that the brain has three functional layers. And I want to go over those with you, and it'll help you understand stress chemistry and worship chemistry. The part that we share with amphibians, okay, um, we have um, a part that we share with amphibians. That's a lower part of a brain. That's the stress part of the brain. That's the part of the brain, the brain stem down at the bottom that you see there. That's a part of the brain that keeps us alive, our fight or flight. Um, I, I, I went to an alligator farm at St. Augustine, and they were feeding these big alligators, okay? And these alligators only have that part of the brain. They don't have the higher parts, the other two layers. They just live on the bottom. They just want to stay alive. They just want to eat, and they just want to reproduce. They, they don't have anything beyond that. They can't love you. They can't, you know, smile at you. They don't have any feelings. That's what they want to do. Well, we have this type of brain that we share with amphibians. We have this part of our brain. Occasionally, there'll be someone that I take care of that's on a ventilator, and they'll say, well, they're brain dead, okay? Well, when we do brain, brain um, stem protocols, we look at each three parts of the brain. Well, they might be you know, brain stem alive, and, but not there's other parts of the brain that aren't working. So it's very complicated to turn off a vent when part of the brain that they share with amphibians is still working. So when you're under stress for long periods of time, the brain is programmed to, to stay alive above all instances. If I'm going to scare you like this, did it scare you? Yeah. <laughs> he, he went to the amphibian part of his brain. And all of a sudden, everything else gets turned off. He's not paying attention. He's not thinking. He's not storing information. He just wants to stay alive because he doesn't know what I'm going to do. So he starts making adrenaline and cortisol, and he says, I might have to run. But he had a pretty developed brain because the higher part said, no, let me sort through this a little bit real quick. Now, he's not going to hurt me. He's just putting on, you know? So, so he knows it. But, but when we're under stress, no matter where the stress comes from, if a semi's coming at us, if something dangerous is happening, that bottom part of the brain takes on, kicks up adrenaline and cortisol. I've seen, you know, heard stories about people that are able to lift, do extraordinary things when their brain's under that kind of stress where they have to do it, protecting families. You know, when your brain's under stress, you want to take care of your own, all of a sudden you get tight and the muscles get. Well, that's coming from this part of the brain that we share with amphibians. You know, when we get starved to death, you know, we turn on these chemicals and we'll eat just about anything when we're starved because we turn off the other parts of the brain that we're going to get to. So that's what we share with you know, amphibians and reptiles. They call it the reptilian part of the brain. Whoops, I don't want to go there. The middle part of the brain, I didn't have to bring my, my pointer here, but the middle part of the brain, let me see if this works here. Whoa. Whoops. Oops. Well, the middle part of the brain, as I, I'm technology starved here. Rick, come up here. Rick Mahoney, for you. he sort of helps me when I, I do this a lot, so I have to bring someone with me wherever I go. I have to go through them all again? Anyway, the middle part of the brain is what we share with mammals, dogs, cats, and we call that the mammalian brain. Dogs and cats and animals, they have a pretty good life. And now I have two dogs. How many people have dogs here? Man, I love dogs. Okay, I'm going to digress for a second before I talk about the mammalian brain. 
Yeah, I'm going to back up one. Can I back up one? Yeah. The mammalian brain, am I saying that right? Mammalian? Yeah. Okay. The mammalian brain is right up in here. It's, it's sort of the middle part. And this is what we share with mammals. Mammals don't live in the future. They can only live in the here and now. They don't have the ability to worry about tomorrow. They just live today. And part of our brains do that too. The middle part of the brain is in charge of things like smell. That's where our olfactory center resides. It stores memories. The midbrain stores memories. It also is the place that regulates our immune system. Our immune system is regulated in the middle part of the brain. Um, this part of the brain is very, very fast. It also houses the part of the brain called the limbic system, which are is emotions. Our emotions are housed there. And they say crimes of passion happen in this part of the brain because it's so fast. It's the fastest part of the brain. So we share this with mammal, mammals, and this is a part of the brain we share with mammals. This is called the midbrain. And the upper part of the brain is unique to humans. And this is called the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain that separates us from animals. Now, a few, a few animals have it. Crows have a little of a, of a neocortex. Whales have it a little bit. Um, and there's a few other mammals that have a little bit. The primates have it, a little bit of neocortex. But this gives us the ability to, to look into the future, to have abstract thought, um, to figure things out, to decide if something's really going to kill us or, or we're safe from it. Well, this is the part of the brain that has logic, and this is the part of the brain we want to activate and live in. We want to turn on this part of the brain. And yet, all of the stress chemistry that we have turn on the lower part of the brain. So when we're under lots of stress, the brain does something called downshifts. So we start using the, the chemistry of the lower part of the brain, which tends to turn on all this stress chemistry. But when we work in the higher part of the brain, we turn down our stress chemistry. So there's three functional layers of the brain. We want to work at the higher parts of the brain, the part of the brain that we're going to learn about that, that grows when we worship. We need all three parts of the brain, and the brain is very complex, and we're just now learning about it. But I had to teach Tom about how the brain worked, and I said, Tom, you are stressed out all the time right now. You're using the... the reptilian part of your brain, you're making a bunch of adrenaline and cortisol, you just want to stay alive, you panic a lot, that turns it on more, and when you just want to stay alive, you, you, know, you do crazy things, you're not thinking through these things rationally. I've had some people that I've taken care of in the past that are so stressed that they can't even work in a higher functioning. Have you ever, has anyone ever hit, let me see here, Darlene, have you ever been in an argument with somebody? I'm right. No, you're not. You're right. I'm right. You're right. Well, you know, when we do that and we get in arguments, our brain's under so much stress that we don't remember 10 to 20% of what the argument's even about. <laughs> that's because we downshift. When we get into the I'm right, you're wrong mentality, that's a downshifting of the brain. If we get into a selfishness, well, that's like, I just want to stay alive. It's all about me. So that downshifts our brain to the part that makes the stress chemistry. Now, guess what the opposite of selfishness is? Love. And we're now finding that the chemistry of love upshifts our brain, and that when we're in a loving spirit, that part of our brain is activated to a greater degree. Well, I wanted to talk about this as we move into the physiology of worship. So McLean comes around and says we have these three functional layers. Well, now we have the ability to look at these layers and see what they do under different situations. We have fancy things like CT scans and PET scanners, and we can make these fan fancy imaging of the brain. And most of the brain imaging techniques we've had today looks at the different parts of the prefrontal cortex as well as the lower parts of brains and see what their metabolism is doing under different situations. This is an EEG. The brain is very complicated. Not only does it have um, chemical connections and things going on in the brain, but it also has an electrical system. And the electrical system 
does things that turn on and off things, that make things happen, that we are just beginning to understand. EEGs, the different types of ways in the brain, where we're finding out that some of those that we turn on are stressful, damaging to the body, some of it is helpful to the body. We frequently use this for people that have epilepsy. When people have epilepsy, the higher parts of the brain don't work at all. But we're now finding out that certain stressful chemistry does the same things to the brain makes the electrical system malfunction. Well, one of the leaders in this field is um, Dr. Andrew Newberg. And he wrote a book a few years ago. And he is um, a very much a leader of this, of how God changes your brain. And if anyone wants to read his book, and um, this is where he actually studied worship and its effect on the brains. And what he looked at is he worked at different methods of worship, different ways of worship, and saw what it did to a brain. And one of the experiments that he did was on a fellow, um, I think his name was Gus. And Gus, he took a brain scan at rest, and then he taught Gus how to worship for 12 minutes a day for two months. And then he rescanned his brain. All the other variables stayed the same. And what he found inside the brain, the part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex started to grow more neurons, started, started to have more neural connections, started to actually grow. And at this time, everyone says, well, we found the God brain. This is where God's communicating. This is the part of the brain that God is talking to us when we worship and communicate with him. And you wonder, you know, what would, be the, what would the brain look like of Enoch, you know, who walked with God? Well, anyway, not only did he see that in just a short period of time he started growing more neural connections, he also measured the chemicals in the brain, some of the stress chemistry in the body, and he found out that worship turned down all of this as well. He also started to study different modes, modes of worship and how some worship was actually damaging to the body. Those that had um, things that just didn't make sense, that type of worship, you know, people hurting each other, um, under a stressful worship where they had to do certain rituals over time where, you know, those things actually had damages to your brain. So we now have the technology to take people, we could study, we could study denominations and we could say, listen, your mode of worship helps you, but it hurts you. It helps you this much, but this helps you this much. Well, they haven't done that yet because these tests are very expensive to run. But Dr. Andrew Newberg, how God changes your brain, is the one that's sort of leading out in this type of neuroimaging. And it's very exciting, the research he's done. Unfortunately, this is very expensive research, and we don't have a drug company that's willing to pay for this. You know, listen, you know, instead of... Instead of um, giving you an anti-anxiety pill, I'm going to talk about worship, teach you how to worship. Well, no one's really buying into that. Um, maybe I could turn your epinephrine this much down with a beta blocker, but this much down with worship. Maybe I could treat heart failure this much with worship, and the medicines only work this much. Let's compare the two. Well, I doubt in my lifetime or anyone's lifetime that's ever going to be done. So the anterior cingulate cortex. But it goes beyond that. There's now research that goes that shows that worship is changing our very genetic makeup, our very DNA. Remember, our DNA, the 64,000 genes that are in each cell of the body, are what's turning on. Um, and you're going to hear words like this in the future. Messenger RNA, um, translation, transcription. These are some of the words that makes the enzyme reactions that decide how we live, that decide how we function, that decide even how we think. So we now have the ability to study how worship affects our very genetics. And the person we have to thank for this is the team um, by Francis Collins. And he wrote the book, The Language of God where he proposes in his book that God's real language is 
how our brain is turning on from a DNA. We can see God's working when we learn how our genetics work. And we talked earlier about this science. This is the new future of medicine in the brain. It's called epigenetics. What turns on the genes to do good things and bad things? What turns on and off aging? Those type of things. Um, epigenetics, you're going to hear about it a lot. But this research is just now coming into being. Um, but Francis Collins sequenced this, and it was so, and when you study this, you, you, see, you see how complicated God and how intricate God has made us. When I study these types of research, I say, wow, I know very, very little, and there's so much more God is going to be doing with us, you know, and I see some of the, um, the brain changes in, in, in different people when they, when they learn how to do these things. It's just amazing. Well, these are mo molecular, and it's not only the genes that's turned on, it's actually even the way these proteins are fold the DNA's folded. That makes a difference in our behavior and which genes are turned on and off, this, how they function in space. It's very, very interesting. Well, at Harvard, Dr. Dusek, and this is um, I'll give you the reference in a second. This is published in a journal called PLOS One. And he did, um, he looked at some people and he did um, a way of, we, we look at the DNA with a, a way called microarray analysis. And this explains how the genes are turned on and off. It's some of the way we can learn a little bit about epigenetics. And he took, he didn't, this was in a big study that he did, but he took 38 people Okay, he had 19 people that was a control, 19 people that he experimented. And before he started, he studied their G DNA. And it's not hard to study DNA. You can get it from skin, tongue, numerous layers. And he looked at all the different genes. And the genes that were related to stress chemistry, he found that there were 2,209 genes that did that. And what he did was he looked, he taught a group how to relax, worship, take some of the stress out of us, and a group that kept on doing what they normally did. And he studied them, I think he studied them for a couple of months. He didn't study them a long time. And then, again, he took other genetic samples. And what he found out, is after doing this, the group that learned how to worship and relax and do those type of things, over 1,500 of those genes, these stress-related genes, actually change the expression just by doing this. He changed the genetics over 1,500 genes, and these genes were responsible for making enzymes that regulated the immune system, lowered stress that affected heart attacks and, and development of all sorts of disease. There was less of a, uh, a process called oxidation, which we know um, lowers decreases our aging, changes the size of our telomeres, um, did all sorts of good things. And this was just one study that was done, again, showing, yes, there's something to Dr. Newberg's studies that showed the brain change. Here's what it could be looking at on a genetic level. Well, I, this, is, this isn't very expensive research. I would love it if Loma Linda would start saying, let's study how worship does and look at the DNA and let's publish some big big randomized trials, worship versus beta blockers for different type of conditions, worship versus this. Well, we now have the technology to prove how worship in and of itself changes our brain, turns off some of the stress chemistry that we've been talking about. So I hope that you can sort of see how worship in itself lowers our stress chemistry, we upshift our brain, we change our brain, we can think better, we can make better decisions, we can worship better, and when we do that, it helps our physical side. And just think, when we eat better, when we have less stress, when we have more water, more light, when we do those things, God gives us the power to enact those things, it improves our brain even further, so it's, it's a cycle. The brain and the body and stress and our physical and spiritual lives are very much interconnected. And I think this is very much exciting research as we know that when we go to, you know, we were designed to worship. We, weren't, we were designed to worship the true God. As we worship today, tomorrow, and throughout life, we're actually coming unto Him 
All you that are under stress, the stress we can control when we can't control, and he's going to give us rest. Now, before I go around my circle again, let's, let's talk about worship, getting to know God, coming unto rest. If you broke your arm, I would put it in a cast. You wouldn't keep using your arm. And yet, if we overuse our brain, if our brain's under too much stress, we downshift. The brain just wants to stay alive. If you're starving, the stress chemistry is turned on. You make some chemicals called leptin and ghrelin. You can't pick a good meal if you wanted to. You just want to stay alive. You're going to eat the first thing that passes your way because your body's under so much stress. I had a lady that came a couple weeks ago, and she was under so much stress um, she'd recently undergone a divorce, problems with her kids. She, you know, she couldn't even, she was under so much stress that she couldn't even worship. That's how much stress was. She says, I can't hear God's voice anymore. I don't feel like I can um, communicate with him anymore. And she had to understand the physiology of stress. Yes, it's possible to be under so much stress. God still was reaching for her, but she was downshifted so much, so much adrenaline and cortisol was going on in her body just to stay alive and cope through the day that she had a hard time moving to that state of worship. That's where Tom was at his life. And I explained to Tom the three types of rest that I've identified that was given to us at creation was the physical rest. And he wasn't getting enough physical rest. Many of us don't Take enough physical rest. You know, our body was designed to rest at night. Our body was designed to take a day off a week and worship. Our body was also designed to not be going 24-7 like we are. I was in France a while back and um, hung out there, and I noticed that they smoked a lot and they drank a lot of alcohol, and, but they didn't have the heart attacks that we had in the United States. Well, they took three or four hours off every day and just rested. You know, they hung out and did the siesta things, and they had much less lower heart attacks. So there was something about this physical rest that God gave us. There's also a second component of rest, and I find this very, very hard for people, and that's to do things that's fun. Enjoy yourself. It's okay to go fishing. It's okay to go shopping and not spend money. It's okay to do these... <laughs> It's okay to, to have a balance in life. It's okay to laugh. It's okay. You have to have that. When the brain does these things, guess what? You, you, you sort of let the brain turn off. The you know, some of the stress turns off. You sort of you know, let the brain reboot like a computer. It's okay to go to a ball game and have a good time. It's okay to laugh with friends. But some people are so busy doing life that they don't have time to let their brain rest. But that's what God gave us to do. You know, God said in the scriptures, a merry heart does good with medicine. Do you think Adam didn't have fun playing with the animals? You know, come on. You know, our God is a God of, of, of fun and laughter. And I would love to have a belly laugh with God. You know, wouldn't that be a great thing? He loves us. He wants what's best for us. And part of it is breaking our routine. You know, that's what a Sabbath does. It breaks our routine. During the day, when we can't be going 24-7, that's what Tom was doing. He was going all the time. He was working 50 hours a week. He was worried about the money. He was worried about this. He never did anything for himself to have fun at all. Well, that's a part of rest, too. Enjoying life, having a balance. And the third part of rest is coming into worship. Coming into worship. Come unto me and I will give you this gift. You have to accept this gift as you worship because it changes your brain, turns off the stress chemistry, keeps you from aging, lowers your risk of heart attack, lowers your blood pressure, helps fighting cancer, helps all these good things in the body. Remember, a biblical prescription doesn't have side effects. A biblical prescription helps every cell do better in the body. So what does it mean to know God? And remember... This is very tricky for me sometimes because words, we communicate a lot of words. And, you know, a lot of people have fears. Well, what does the fear really mean? Well, sometimes words to me just means, well, fear represents the physiology in the brain where you're using your amygdala 50% of the time, you're using the prefrontal cortex in this amount of time. These are chemical reactions that represent words. So fear for you, the chemistry of the, that word, might be different than the chemistry over here. So words, whether that be love 
or that be worship, it might turn on different chemical pathways from every person here. Does that make sense? Words are just uh, our frail way of describing many times physiologic states. Well, what is fear? What is love? What's the genetics in our brain looking at when we say the word love? It might be different from you than you than someone else. So what does it mean to know God? Well, we know through these studies that knowing God changed the anterior cingulate cortex. We know that knowing God physiologically changes our, our, our genes. We know that when we worship, we can get to know God. And yet, the more I have a relationship with God, the, realize, the more I realize it, I just have to have faith. You know, I don't understand. Lots of things I don't understand. I just have to have faith and do what he asked me to do and just step out and believe because I know that our God is faithful and true and he's going to take care of me. I know he's asked me to come to him and worship him and he's going to give me rest. Not that I necessarily understand everything. But I do know, remember the text, to know God is to love God. God is love. So it has something to do with this word called love, and we know that love physiologically turns on the the prefrontal cortex, turns on that part of the brain, turns down the selfish part of the brain. So we know that love is putting our interest above someone else's. But we know that this relationship, this rest, leads, leads us towards the physiology of love, whatever that looks like. We know that that is the opposite of the stress chemistry that's opposite of selfishness which downshifts our brains so we don't worship as well so we know that this is one way we can get to this chemistry is to love god is to know and that leads us to the physiology of rest how many here when you get sick think i need to rest more now i'm preaching to the choir here but most of the world don't even think about rest they don't think about the, the, the one day a week off, going to bed earlier at night, all these things that cause stress on our bodies. They don't think about worship as a treatment. They also don't think about having fun as a treatment. When you're out having fun, your endorphins go up. Now, I guess got a thought in my mind. Pets, okay? This is a good one. When you look your dog in the eye, or cat, how many are dog people? Okay. I have two Shorkies at home. Does anyone have Shorkies? Okay, they're little doggies, and I love them to death. I come home, they follow me around. They actually change my stress chemistry. That's one of the breaks I have during the day, is I play with my dogs. There's studies done that when you look in a dog's eye, and he, looks, he or she looks back at you, you make a chemical in your body go up called oxytocin. Oxytocin helps turn down stress chemistry, like endorphins. When you also look at your spouse lovingly, that makes that same chemical go up, oxytocin. So if you want to start treating each other, look someone lovingly in the eye. Of course, it's got to be, you know, you know, appropriate lovingly, you know, you know, that kind of thing. But you change the chemistry. And as we learn these things, I realize how complicated the body is. And I started, you know, I asked Tom, you know, you have any dogs? I said, just try to look at the dog in the eye. That's going to lower some of your stress chemistry. And sure enough, it did. Have anyone ever noticed that the dogs like to look you in the eye too? Oh, there's a reason behind that. God gave us animals and pets that we're supposed to take care of them. And you know what? They help take care of us. Sometimes I said, God, I wish you'd have made me a dog. Because my dogs have a pretty easy life. They don't have to worry about the future because they, you know, they just live in the here and now. They don't have to worry about things. They just, they just lay down. They look me in the eye. They're happy. They follow me around. They get their meals free. No works involved. Right, right. But some people really do well with having pets and as a component of rest. So I throw that in there. You say, well, how can I? I don't like to go out and do anything for, you know, well, get, some, you know, get a pet. Maybe that will lead you to the chemistry of rest. Rest, as we found out, these three types of rest decreases the stress chemistry in the body. Adrenaline, cortisol, inflammation goes down. It helps our aging process. It turns on all these good cells which help us fight disease. It actually changes the telomeres in our body, um, which is one of the causes of aging. And worship, 
I now can honestly say that there's science to show that worship is a treatment for chronic disease. Now, if you're having a heart attack, worship will help you, okay? But I would deal some modern medicine for that. But as Tom worked through all these physiology of worship and added these to his life, his stress chemistry got better. He started to get better. As he learned to come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I wanted to leave you in our last session to, to, together, let you know that worship is a biblical prescription for life. And if you have worship in your life, that relationship with God, that's going to lead you to your purpose. What is God calling us to do? And we realize that the more we study health, the more I study that it's about what God has done for us through His Son. I can't do anything of myself. It's through that relationship that He gives me the power. I can't do anything good on my own, and if I'm doing good on my own, I'm selfish. I'm activating my selfish chemistry and not my prefrontal cortex chemistry. So I have to do things because I have God in my heart. And I found that he, as the relationship's grown, He moves me one step at a time. He doesn't always take me to A to Z. But I do know that His grace is enough to make up for my weaknesses. And when occasionally I'll have a patient that will come in and they're nearing the end. And I know that they can't do these other things. I know that they can't deal with the stress chemistry. And I let them know that you still have a Savior that can heal you. And He decides the where, when, and how. And I also tell them that sometimes God heals us through our illnesses. We don't really know because we can't know all the complexity of God. So I want to thank you here, let you know that worship is a biblical prescription for life. I have some more questions to go through. I'm also going to be available this evening. If you have some questions next door, um, Rick and I will be there. Okay. So if you have some questions, write them out. Then I'm going to still get to some of the questions we had earlier. But don't forget that your worship is the key biblical prescription for life. Okay, here's a question that's come in. And if, Rick, let me know if we're, I'm running short time. My wife is a...